Hello everyone, this is your host Andrew Pledger and I am a survivor of Bob Jones University and this is Beyond BJU Exposing Fundamentalism which is a podcast that sheds light on Christian fundamentalism in the context of Bob Jones University. The show includes survivor stories from BJU and also Bob Jones affiliated ministries like Christian day schools, camps, and churches. The podcast also explores BJU's influence beyond the school and its impact on American society. I want to thank my Patreon supporters who allow me to do this work, and if you could join my Patreon, it would be greatly appreciated. The link is in the description of every episode. But if you feel that you can't do that, then I would appreciate it if you would leave a 5-star rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts because this helps other listeners like you discover the show. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am so happy to have Jay Hosini on the show today. Thank you so much, Jay, for coming on the show. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. No, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, I'm really curious about your story because your parents were not attenders of BJQ and they were also Calvinist and that made you a threat to Bob Jones University and I know you also have a lot of stories to share, but for people who are not familiar, could you introduce yourself? So share a little bit maybe about your religious upbringing. So when it comes to a religious background and upbringing, I would say I was the 1.5 generation Christian in the sense that my parents, when they got married and, and had me, were not Christians. They were pretty avowed, loud atheists. And would also probably would have considered themselves socialist at that point in time back in the 80s. Partially because my dad's side comes from a long line of socialist labor party activists. So very, from that side is very scientific. My grandpa was a double doctorate. My great grandma ran for vice president in the United States in 1956 on the SLP ticket. So just very, that side was very much that. Mom's side was what my parents would call like nominal Christian and would attend loosely even evangelical church. I think they still attend to this day. But that side of the family was much more blue collar-ish, typical run-of-the-mill white American type folk. So they weren't really, yeah. So nothing really descript about their religious sides. My parents met in, in Washington State, not much later moved up to Alaska, which is where I was born. And about five years later is when my mom rediscovered religion. And oddly enough, it was like a woman pastor in a church in Fairbanks, Alaska. So it was way up north. And we were actually had already moved from Fairbanks down, you know, 1200 miles south of there. Mind you, Alaska is bigger than Texas. I don't know if people are aware that it's that much bigger than all the other states. So distances are weird like that. <laughs> There's only two major cities, Fairbanks and Anchorage, and they're 12, 1300 miles apart or whatever. So it's, yeah. So we had moved way down south to the coast, but my mom had randomly popped into a church for whatever reason. She had some sort of spiritual experience and that kind of set her on a more, on that kind of path. My dad still at that point in time was pretty atheist. He had met with the pastor that my mom had found down it, there on the Kenai Peninsula, which is where we had moved to there in Alaska. And he looked at the pastor, we'll call him just Jack. He looked at Jack and said, it's going to take the God of this Bible to come down. And he said some sort of euphemism, blank me in the blanket, he was way off, like very sailor mouth. And I think two weeks later, he was a Christian. So again, so there was pretty drastic changes then that I remember as a four or five year old, because it was like 93, 94, I think is when all that happened, where it's like, there was no longer beers in the fridge there. My dad wasn't screaming profanities at the Packers game, but I was the only child who observed that. And then my parents proceeded to procreate seven more times. Oh. So yeah. And that pastor was very Calvinist. And that 
became an issue at the church that my parents originally attended and that church split. Uh, we did a home church thing that met at several different people's houses. It was very hippie. It was very, we gave the seventies a run for their money, even though this was the late nineties, mid to late nineties. We then did the whole homesteading thing and we're out in the woods in Alaska without electricity or running water and had goats and hand pump, all the stuff in the documentaries and reality TV shows, except we actually had to do it. And we were 200 miles from the nearest Walmart. But yeah, very remote. So that's how I grew up in general. It was very remote, but definitely it was a point of contention with that Calvinism and with that stuff where eventually Jack stepped away from the pastorate for 10 years. We found another pastor who was best friends and classmates with Bob Jones the third, Ron and Triple Sticks, as we as we call them, were were the thickest thieves to the point that the, the Triple Sticks would come up for fishing trips and stuff every couple of years and, and would be at our church for a couple of weeks. So there was very much that integration and closeness within the, the Bob Jones circles and the Bob Jones curriculum. But Ron also had nine kids when he had been a missionary to Japan. So he basically went from Japan and a couple other places and then ended up in Alaska. So it's all new Japanese and, you know, had good jobs translating and all that kind of stuff. And then his kids also would resell uh, Bob Jones curriculum. So there was very much like we had a whole little, little satellite system, literally and figuratively. My family was the first to install HomeSat in Alaska. I, I helped put in and maintain that satellite dish. It was a 12 foot dish pointed at like 0.5 above the horizon point and had to cut down a bunch of trees just to receive satellite feeds to TiVo record to a first a VHS and DVD for home set classes. So I was trained much like the kids in the academy, but I was in the literal dark in the woods in Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's interesting that we're talking about home set now because Someone commented on my social media that they grew up using Homestat. Yeah, and what's funny is they continued that program for a while as they never turned it into an OTT channel, which I think is a missed opportunity on their part. They had it as a hard drive based thing where you could basically buy a, a, an SSD or an H, a HD device and it had all that. You know, here's your mask for the year or whatever. And plug it in and watch all the classes. Which wasn't near as fun as watching at double speed and getting over it. Class is faster. But yeah, so media, it's satellite stuff and media creation and working with software and computers and everything. I had to do that all the way back in the, in the day. Ironically, what I do now is radio, television, special effects, software. But that started all the way back then. A major key shift, though, that did happen religiously and logistically with my family centered mostly on the fact that my parents were Calvinists and also did not have the same viewpoints about end times. They were all pre-trib, pre like classic Left Behind series, 90s theology. And so Ron semi-retired and the missionary we had sent to South Africa who had grown up in Alaska, he decided to come back home. Now, looking back, I'm realizing some of the stuff he said was pretty pro-apartheid and problematic. Basically, he was like, now that apartheid's gone, it just, it's, I can't send my daughters to the mall anymore. And just, wait, what? Things that make you go, hmm, no. But yeah, very much cut from the cloth and died in the wool, like cookie cutter kind of Bob Jones guy, where I feel like Ron was more of a millennial or I think he even called himself like a pan millennial, it'll pan out, we'll figure it out kind of thing. He tried to really toe the line of keeping hands off and not preaching 10 week or what we would jokingly call it later, so the 70 weeks of Daniel, jokingly saying that he, that this pastor, his, his name is Kit. So Kit would just, that's all he focused on was that. And then the problems of Calvinism and mostly not even directly at the theology, but just more casting aspersions at Calvin and, and the other sort of Calvinistic patriarchs or whatever you'd call them without uh, more of like character assassination stuff and less about, oh, here's why the theology is wrong. Because he really couldn't argue about that very well. And that, it was at that point in time that I started really digging in. And I was all in on this stuff at that point in time. I made a profession of faith and 
I had a very fear-based experience, but a very memorable point in time when I was 12 or 13, like when I made a profession of faith and was very all in on it at that point in time. And I wasn't one to like half-ass things. I studied the crap out of everything. Interestingly enough, my uncle helped build the software that's called eSword, which is basically a freeware version of, of uh, Logos Bible software. And so I had beta access to that. And so I, I had a, a lot of that resource at my fingertips on my school laptop at home. So I could sit there and do deep word studies on, hey, this pastor said this, let me go actually go through and check the marked up Strong's Concordance and check the marked up everything cross-referenced in the computer and actually look at what these word meanings are and look into the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin and actually do my own research as best I could at that age. And what was interesting was how poorly that was received. Instead of that curiosity and that natural questioning, but the curiosity not to just prove the pastor wrong, but more to, hey, you keep saying every time that wine is mentioned in the Bible in a positive sense that it's grape juice and anytime it's in a bad sense about drunkenness or whatever, it's wine. And I was like, that, my bullshitometer is going off. That seems odd. Let me go and check. And then sure enough, oh, wait, the Greek word for wine is oinos. And, and that is very clearly used in both positive and negative contexts. Don't be drunk with oinos, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus turned water into oinos. Like all of those kind of things. And so it's, but it's, and they had, Greeks were all about their wine. So they had very technical words for all the whole process through. Here's what fresh grape juice, well, here's these three words for fresh grape juice. So if there was a specificity like wanted and intended here, you'd think that it wouldn't be this secret translation and secret interpretation that was so common, I think of the pastors in, in the nineties, especially in in isb was very much like i'm effectively the pope of my church and i'm effectively the voice of god for my people and only i know i have the secret knowledge and you guys don't and and that was that attitude and i thought it was just bad personality trait on kit's part and that stemmed very deeply like it was to the point that like so then when dad had cancer that's when kit took the opportunity to pull me aside and in so many words tell me that my parents were heretics and started doing like sidecar Bible study classes with me, trying to convince me of the end time stuff and anti-Calvinistic stuff. Meanwhile, again, we were in a more remote-ish Alaska. I was the only teenage boy two years on either side of me. So like I was isolated in that way. I was definitely this isolated, ostracized kind of nerd because we were not just brown nosing to the leadership we were doing our best to like stick to our guns in that way and not just out of stubbornness though there's probably a little bit of that from best i could tell with me and my parents it was from genuine care for the text and care for historical theology and all that but then i get to bob jones and i realized kit was just a very well programmed robot and he was just doing what he was programmed to do from the mothership yeah, it's so, interesting that you said mothership because Aaron Birchville, she refers to Bob Jones as a mothership. <laughs> no, it's, it, they are the board. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. And so there, there was very much, even down to the point where you are not a person, you're a number. Give me your student ID. Not, how are you doing? Not, how's everything hitting you right now? Like, how are you settling in? But X, Y, or Z doesn't check. Your tie isn't cinched up enough because i was still there when you had to wear a tie till noon i think they dropped that rule my sophomore year and so it was very much uh, within two to three weeks i realized oh i was very directly lied to by my onboarding admissions counselor about a lot of things he made it sound like this chill place where i could skateboard and express myself and have my own style and there would be groups of friends that all had similar interests and all of that. And, it, and I very quickly realized that there was still the old guard who hated Calvinism. There was very much an anti, like an, anything that seemed to express skate punk, skater culture was very 
taboo. And I remember specifically that there was, uh, it never happened to me, but two or three of my buddies who had skateboards, like the, the Bojo 50, the wannabe hot fuzz on campus broke some skateboards in half. And because there was a lot of, yeah, it, it was very much anti any other subcultures besides a very specific cookie cutter that they wanted everybody to be. So that was definitely a, a learning experience. And there was multiple sh cultural shocks. Like I'd never been anywhere on the East Coast, definitely not to the Southeast. In my mind, it's the South. So I show up and I'm, I kid you not, in a bolo tie and a cowboy hat and boots to Bob Jones. I found very quickly that is not standard attire in the South, in, in especially the upstate of South Carolina. It's more Lacoste and those douchey shorts. I'm looking at all those Clemson grads. They have a very specific look. But I realized, oh, it's preppy and trust fund boy attire, not any of these other things. So uh -huh. just that cultural shock, we took a minute too. And then remind me of the year that you arrived at Bob Jones. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at Bob Jones from 2007. I switched majors four times, graduated in December 2011 and walked in May 2012. Okay. And so you grew up on the Bob Jones curriculum through HomeSat. And yep. is that really what brought you to the universities? Yeah. I mean, there was definitely a bit of that. There wasn't pressure from my parents as much. There was this idea of educational excellence that was very much instilled throughout all of the HomeSat curriculum. It's very sneaky guerrilla marketing that definitely said, this is the best Christian education you can get. And throughout those years at Bob Jones, I realized how inaccurate that statement was, both on the educational side and the religious side. They really didn't have their shit together. <laughs> and that their seminary was a, a choke and that they're not respected by any other theological powerhouses. And that their film department that I was in was deeply understaffed and undertooled and 10, 15 years behind the times on gear and, and same went for their TV and radio programs. And like when it came to the scholastic side, like it was an adjustment for me, but I was able to keep my grades relatively okay because I was effectively self-taught from seventh grade on. My parents did not teach me anything. I had my mom just buy the teacher's guide since the teacher's guide contained the full textbook and then all the teacher's notes. And I would just read and study all that and then take the test. And that's how I, that's how I did homeschooling. Uh, okay. And yeah, so you get to Bob Jones University, number one, struggling to fit in with the South, not knowing, and then becoming disillusioned to the reality of Bob yeah. Jones University. Yeah. So what were some core experiences you had at Bob Jones? You wrote out a little bit of your story and you talked about yeah. how you really exploited loopholes in the real book and would be ridiculous with some things. Yes. So I'm curious. Like, yeah. Once I realized, and I realized this pretty early, early on, but once I realized that it was all about control and kind of the mind game around, we think we're the replacement for your parents did a, our fuck ups and did a shit job was like the mindset of Bob Jones, because I saw them directly go against my parents' requests and wishes. Like, when it came to, I, I wanted to go to a specific church that was like gray listed. And they put you through all these hoops to get your parents to approve for you to go to a church because it was Calvinistic. And, and it's no, I'm doing literally, this is blessed by my parents. What the heck? And it was just, yeah, your parents have spiritual issues kind of thing. And it's like, all right, then. So it very much, again, they were the final authority. They were the mothership. They were the Vatican. And everyone else needed to fuck off with their opinions or application of their Christian walk or whatever. And so, yeah, some of the core experiences were definitely where I did my damnedest to really keep my nose clean. I, I think I had five old emirates that first year. And that's, mind you, this was still when, again, their hair check stuff was pretty Nazi. And they still required us to have ties on till after chapel. So up, up until lunch, you were wearing a tie. And, oh, and you'd get demerits for being late to class because this was before. The, I think there was some sort of accreditation thing that they weren't allowed to do that eventually. But 
when I first got there, that was not the case. So you'd get, I think it was like a two, two, four, four demerit count every time, like every concurrent time you were late to class. And I was able to keep it to, I think, five demerits the whole first year I was there. But that, for whatever reason, wasn't good enough in their mind. And they, I think I had maybe 20, 25 demerits my sophomore year. And when they put me up to be like a assistant prayer captain or whatever for the room I was in, instead, they put me on spiritual probation. And basically because, again, I was Calvinist and disagreed with Bob Jones music standards, even though I didn't act out on any of them. Yeah. And could you explain what spiritual probation is for people who don't know? Yeah. So spiritual probation is a arbitrary assignment that the university essentially gives you a slip of paper saying that we have weighed you in the scales and found you wanting, spiritually speaking. Sometimes in, in my case, it was just double speak for we disagree with you and you ask too many questions or you raise too much of a stink or whatever. And even though behaviorally we don't, we have nothing to peg on you, we can still put some sort of black spot on, on you to disallow you from leadership positions, both on the class side and any sort of student body leadership. And granted, I wasn't ever really aiming for a lot of student body leadership. I think that the highest position I ever held was spirit leader for the Wolverines, which was probably my worst decision was joining that society because of course we didn't have normal fraternities like normal people. We had literary societies that still had Greek letters. So we thought we sounded cool. Just the nerdiest society that also were nerdy enough to win anything like all, all the big nerd powerhouses like Brian and whatever would wipe the floor with us on the nerd side, like with debate or trivia or whatever like that. And then sports wise, we would struggle to win a game of soccer or volleyball. That's because me and two yeah. or three other guys were, were good. Like uh-huh. they're the Hawaiian kid and me who, who were really good at volleyball. So we were okay at that, you know, <laughs> that and maybe ping pong. Otherwise we, we were the losers. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really curious then about you handling the rules or the loopholes that you found and where were some yeah. ridiculous you, things you yes. did. So once I realized it was that mind game and once I realized it was about that control, I started to devise my own plan. And my plan was, I will follow the letter of your rule to the T, gladly. Now watch me exploit every little loophole. Watch me force you to get even more pedantic and stupid with your rules. And to the point that I think by my senior year, I had almost a dozen rules that I could point to in their rule book that they had made to make even more granular and even more scrupulous and, and whatever to the point of ridiculousness in some cases. I think one of the ones was I hated this whole fact that we had to wear just this stupid like suit and tie get up every for every event. For We had Vespers. I don't know if you guys had that when I was like, I think they got rid of that when I was still in college. But at Vespers every other Sunday, there was just you were always in a, a, a suit and tie. And there's only so many ways you can arrange that. And it just doesn't feel very creative or expressive. So what I started to do is I had a couple nice graphic polos that I would put over the button down in the tie and pop the collar like it was the 80s and then put my suit over it. Th- that was one of many rules where it's, no, you're not allowed to layer like that. It only can be layered with a vest. Um, and that vest can't have too much blah, blah, blah. Again, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep jabbing and I'm going to keep making you guys make stupid rules so that future generations of students see how fucking ridiculous you are and also just as a cathartic eh, got you there and so that's once i realized i was just a number and they didn't care about that they cared about control it's fine we'll play that game if you want to control me enjoy here's how we'll play this game and that's mentally how i got through my five years almost five years of bob gems and what were some other rules that you exploited or tested around oh let's see i'll have to way back in the memory bank here myself and about five or six other people figured out a exploitation of the student ID kiosk system that you could essentially, I want to say you led with a zero or an asterisk or something on the search to look up someone and it would show you that person's full ID number 
and name. Meaning, you could look up any staffer's ID, faculty or staff. So for many times, when I would get written up for hair check, I would give them stu Stephen Jones' student ID. And it, especially since they weren't even asking my full name, how, they were just asking my number. All right, here's a number. It's a real number. And so, oh my God, that's hilarious. Eventually they closed the loophole and eventually they started asking for full names. But me and I'd say probably half a dozen or a dozen other students definitely exploited that goofy. I, again, this is what happens when they built that whole security portal and info man and all of that stuff that they used for like login and their whole like draconian like check in, check out you're not allowed off campus without a pass kind of like the Nazi subculture that they built had set themselves up for that kind of failure. Yeah, I'd say the other rules were they were not smart enough to know that phones had internet. And mine was one of the first to have it. I had the Palm Trio for a long time while I was at Bob Jones. So I had access to Facebook when that was blocked on campus and nobody else was allowed to use it. So there was both Facebook and Twitter was starting to come up as I was leaving. And so there was this subculture of resistance and of snark that only me and a couple other people were able to actually do that posting. And I think there was a lot of like, how are they doing this? Because again, it didn't register that these people have a cell phone plan that has 3G internet and are able to go to these sites uninhibited on the free and open internet. And so there was definitely that there were such sticklers about pants and about the type of trousers and slacks you had to wear. And it was at that point in time, I discovered, oh, there's a lot of Chino jean materials that could pass for slacks. And so I definitely utilized that. I also worked at Hollister during the summers, which was a, a major point of contention. When I showed up for the first several times, my now spouse's parents' church which was very in with Bob Jones. There was a ton of faculty and staff and even some of my spouse's family members that were both faculty and staff and heavy leadership there at that church. So when I show up in the summer, Hollister button down, an obvious Hollister, like undershirt, Hollister jeans to that church, it definitely sent a message. But yeah, so there's a lot of those kind of things where it was like wearing a necklace just outside of the outline of the visibility of the collar or purposefully wearing a tie. Okay, fine, I'll wear a tie, but even though it's not required anymore, but I'll purposely have it half mask and loose. I just, I can still wear a tie. And just all of those kind of jabs and dives because that was where I was trying to get them to the point where they had, no, you have to use this, you have to use a full Windsor and it needs to be this many fingers from your neck. And I wanted them to get that stupid technical just because it's like, this is again, to show the ridiculousness of it. And what's interesting is the things that I eventually got written up for, and even I got socialed my June more year, like my second sophomore year, if you will. And it was like, they, it was all in technicalities. I was very passionate, but still careful with my words. And I said something, I was talking with a friend and I said something was bull crap because we weren't allowed to say bullshit, but bull crap, it's fine. And I think that got me 50 demerits. And then the other thing that put me over was oh that's right i was all about exploiting their weirdness around hats and hat rules so yes i might be wearing a suit and tie but i've got this punky bill turned to the side on top what are you going to do about it are you going to make a rule that hats aren't allowed to be turned half like slightly cocked or backwards or what, what are you, you going to do but this specific time i had just blanked and forgotten to remove my hat inside of buildings because that was a rule at that point in time. I don't know if it still is, but you had to remove a hat every time you were in a building, unless you were a woman, whatever. And one of the hostesses, which I don't know if they still have those, but essentially hostesses were like, if you've watched Handmaid Tales, so they were like the eyes. That's exactly what they were. They were the eyes. And they would report and confront if they saw any any touching or people were making too much of an intimate glance like they're making eye babies too much and break it up and hey six inches like back off from each other that was their enforcement 
And what I didn't realize is that they also would enforce the other rules, like hat rules, apparently. And I knew this person very well. I had gone on Thanksgiving, you know, break, like vacations with her and her now husband and all, all that group. So it was weird that she was the one who ended up putting me over the 75 and getting me socialed, as in disallowed from integrating with and and interacting with uh, the opposite gender. And I think I just, I put my hat back on as I was going out the door and she wrote me up for like direct disobedience or something. And I'm like, but I was going outside. I had my stuff in my hands. And so I put my hat on and pushed the door open. Okay. Um, so then I'm, you know, marching down to get read the riot act by John Dalton. Um, and yeah, my interactions with him were always very interesting. Um, there was another t- with that only other story I have with him that I know I can share is there was another student that worked alongside me at the, what was then the snack shop, which is now they've sold it off to, I don't know, Chick-fil-A and a couple other chain restaurants. But back then it was, everything was cooked inside still. And we bust the tables and it was full sit down and to go experience that was all self-sourced by the university. And so I was a cashier and did everything else, like everything from baking and grill and closing, I could do it all. And he was stealing money from the tills. The way he would do that was he would exploit yet again, they had all their homegrown POS system and their homegrown everything. And it was very exploitable. He figured out a keystroke or whatever to pop the drawer open, like an override. If, for example, I had to step away from the till real quick to help a customer or throw something away or whatever, if I didn't lock the till down fully, it was essentially an open, unsecured one that he or technically anybody could just exploit. And he had been doing that for a while. And I get called back by the the manager, like the manager, GM or whoever he was of, of the, all the restaurants there on campus. And he just outright accuses me of stealing. And I'm like, I know I didn't look on your security tapes. You'll see, I didn't steal anything. I'm clear here. And that's when he admitted that those were fake security cameras and that he didn't have footage. And I was like, do you want me to get a lawyer? Do you want me to lawyer up here or what do you want me to do? And so there was, and it was interesting because both with me and my spouse, we were on multiple ends of both accusations. And in my spouse's case, she had been stolen from. And there was very much a don't call the cops, we'll handle it inside, which is a direct, clear violation of reporting violations when it comes to student safety and, and all of that. And it was very interesting because I saw them be very selective with who they would turn over to authorities and not. I saw them turn more than half a dozen of my classmates who were people of color directly over to authorities, make them sit the night at the police station and all that jazz. But if it was a white girl whose parents were staffers who who was stealing from my girlfriend at the time, a little different approach. So I was seeing even there like, the pretty overt racism that was still pretty deep in the university. I was also seeing that one of my first girlfriends was a black girl from uh, Maryland and and the way that they glared at us. And it's like the interracial dating rule had been dropped six and a half, seven years before that, but it was still a lot of the older faculty and staff, I think that just could not handle the sight of a pasty white boy or vice versa with someone of other heritages and race. But yeah, there was a lot of that kind of, I can see looking back, oh, there's a lot of ways that I was bucking against that culture, trying to express myself in whatever way I could and, and not play into the mind games. And they even like when they pulled me in to to question me and, and like formally accuse me back up at their Dina men's office, he had this like giant military questioning tactics book on the table as again, it was this, again, the mind game and the show of force and show of power. And I ripped him a new one. I said, is this how you, like, you call yourself a Christian university and this is not according to any of the stipulations or set ways set out in, in the scriptures about this, right? Nor is it legal. If you're accusing me of something that is a criminal case, I have a right to a lawyer and I have a right to have my own defense here. And I don't have to say anything to you. But again, 
I know I'm innocent. And if you guys would actually capture footage of your own pills, you'd know that. And they, by the way, eventually did catch him and never apologized to me and never gave me back till privileges. So there was this, we don't trust you. You're guilty until proven innocent. And even when we found out that, oh no, you're, you're actually in the clear, too bad. Damage is done. We don't trust you. And there was very much that there was no trust. It was all suspicion. And, and that was the culture there as a whole. Wow. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. Yeah, that's, that is a lot. And it, I, I laughed when you said they had no security cameras. They were fake. It's just it sounds typical of them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Just like they had fake police officers in their <laughs> fake little Dodge caravans with fake lights on top that they'd fake chase you around their fake little campus and act like they were so real with their with their little radios. And what's hilarious is that there's this direct pipeline from public safety and law enforcement training at Bob Jones to the local police forces. There's a lot of that direct pipeline crap in Greenville that happens. It's part of the reason why my spouse and I left is we just hated that sort of everything was a direct offshoot and branch and sourced by Bob Jones in, in, in Greenville County and the upstate in general. And we got tired of it. And we also just needed a little space from the in-laws and space from all the stuff to do with Bob Jones. And my job at the time was offering to move me to work in New York City. So I said, why not? That sounds like a great opportunity. So I got that. But I, the, my first three years after Bob Jones, I was working at the ballpark just three miles from the university. And Still had a lot of interns and staff members that were associated with the university in some way. But yeah, so I don't know if I was ever technically blacklisted, though I probably am now, especially after the Grace Report stuff, especially and, and everything to do with all of that. I don't know if we have time to talk about that. If you, I'm not sure if you. Yeah. The Grace Report stuff started with both there was a national case to do with Tina Anderson and a deacon in her pastor, Chuck Phelps uh, church up in Connecticut. That church was a direct, a cedar church. They definitely had direct connection to Bob Jones down to the fact that Chuck Phelps was a board member of, of Bob Jones, which if you've ever been in the board member, and it is an interesting experience. It is gilded gold chair. Like it feels like a, a Trump's wet dream place. It's all gilded gold plated everything like 40 or 50 chairs up in the upstairs of the library, actually. Yeah. So that's where, that's the actual boardroom where, they, where the board members meet. They, they also store all the old like regalia there. And I definitely put on Bob Jones Jr.'s regalia and have a picture or two of, of, of myself and his regalia and holding the golden shovel that they use to like break grounds for RMA for the auditorium. Yeah little sidebar there but that's so the board members all met in there and i knew also my friend nikki's father is also a board member and nikki's father was more of on the progressivist side of you know, of the board members and chuck and his old school pals were obviously on the opposite side so all of these initial reports started coming out in the national news media and, and nikki at the time were classmates in, in radio and television and we already had created a radio show called Content Advisory. The idea behind it was like Vice News style journalism, like punchy, hard hitting, deep dives, new takes, new cuts, current events, but with a little bit more of a snark twist and a little bit more of a hard hitting journalism kind of twist. And we didn't have a crazy big listenership or anything like a, a radio station was weak enough that once you got off the grounds of the campus, it didn't distribute. Uh, you could listen to it online, though, even back in the day. So those court cases were progressing. And the sort of initial statements from either side were starting to come out. I think Camille, Camille Lewis had started an activist branch off campus because by that time, I think she'd already been disowned yeah, by. She was booted in 07. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So, yeah. So it was like three and a half, four years after she had been booted but still was very associated and at that point in time wasn't blacklisted or anything she and a couple other concerned alumni were starting up that kind of progressivist action to try to for accountability and then on the chuck phelps side there was a lot of doubling down and leadership protection and the normal and so what myself and nikki did on our show 
was that we really just read statements from the Phelps side and said, hey, this is what they're saying. Here's some news articles about the general observations. Yes, this deacon is serving prison time now. Yes, something happened here, right? I also, though, had insider information on that church because the guy I would go to church carpool with to my Calvinistic church grew up in that church and was there when they forced Tina to like go up and confess quote unquote sin and all like all of that. So I had direct visual witnesses who could confirm that, yep, no, this is what happened. And then even then, eventually, I was going to church with the family that she was sent to. I had double, triple verification happening there. It was like, nope, this occurred. Meanwhile, I had several other friends who had deeply terrible, rough sexual abuse in their background. And I was seeing how the current administration at the time and former dean of students who had been very published with their spiritual books and had posted a lot of privacy violations and untruths about people. And again, direct clery reporting violations, or they were supposed to report those sorts of abuses to local authorities and they didn't and protected the perpetrator and blamed and ostracized the victim. And that was like the pattern we were seeing. And that was happening dozens of different places and times with students I knew, both on campus, as well as in some cases, it was their own fathers who was, we were exploiting them uh, and that kind of thing. And even sex trafficking in some cases. There was a lot of kind of deep, dark shit happening there. And me and only about six other active students with the help of, uh, of Camille started to organize a silent protest structure. And word got out because I also interviewed Chris Peterman. I don't know if you guys have interacted much with him, but I also interviewed Chris Peterman, who is one of the other activist students. He and I worked together since my freshman year. So we knew each other very well as, as well. So we were pretty close. And so he, he was one of the few people leading the charge kind of internally, but was also starting to get the university nipping at his heels, if you will about petty stuff like watching the off campus or whatever. We were starting to see the university breathing down our necks because we were onto something. And to the point that when Chuck Phelps' son, who was a hall leader, I want to say, who was like a sophomore hall leader, which sounds suspicious, he was allowed to be put into leadership because of who his daddy was. The university, specifically Bob Jones III, got wind from Phelps' son that, they're making radio shows against my dad. Do something about it. And Bob Jones III really wanted mine and Nikki's radio show audio. And my department head at the time, her name's Heidi, she did her best to make sure that a technical glitch happened and that the audio somehow was missing. She knew that we were onto something and that kind of where our heart was with this is that it wasn't out of some sort of, I don't know, we weren't being punks. We were being pretty journalistic about it for each other and just trying to get to the bottom of things and bring awareness to it. And so she made sure that audio didn't exist, which obviously infuriated the administration. And mind you, by this time, Bob Jensen was just a chancellor. He was not active leadership. He was a figurehead by this time. And but yeah, so we went on with the silent protest. Um, and there was only, I think, six students out of a student body of 3,000 that both wore red because uh, that was our thing to wear a specific bright red color and then go over onto the Bridge of Nations after the chapel hour. We knew this was going to be a higher visibility chapel hour because it was toward the end of the se semester and everything and release red balloons from the Bridge of Nations. There was a lot of media presence. There was also campus security all packed in, a lot of hecklers, people yelling threats. And we even had one person pull out a knife and stab some of the balloons, the safety officers, who didn't really do anything about it, but we were able to release the rest of the balloons that didn't get stabbed and go on with our day. Immediately after though, they came up with the bogus stuff and expelled Chris Peterman. And again, we're trying their best to get me and Nikki and the two other friends that were also in the media and radio and television department expelled. And yeah, so there was a lot of that underground if you will. And I think that we even had, there was a couple groups, other sort of 
early disinfected Bob Jones alumni groups that we were definitely a part of, where a lot of these early stories were being shared and a lot of these privacy violations and these clear, direct failure to report assault kind of things were being shared and, and made aware of. And thankfully, in my case, I was a town student after that and was a, lived off campus and, and worked a good bit the rest of that summer and that fall was my final couple credits that I had to take and then walked the next year. Thankfully, I was able to fly under the radar and, and disappear from public eye, but still get my degree finished out. And I already had my job with the ballpark lined up. Thankfully, I was able to just scoot away quietly into the night, more so than several of my other colleagues, partially because I, I wasn't from one of the big families. My pa parents weren't board members or alumni themselves. There was the ability to just slink into the darkness a little more easily which I feel a well, little lucky and privileged that I didn't have to do as much as a lot of the other people did to try to finish their dang degree that they paid for and were getting expelled and all that. So Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I didn't realize you played a part in that protest, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing it. Wow. I know I'm hoping to have Chris Peterman on the show. He's yes. been on my list. I'm like, yeah. Do it. Anyways, yes. yeah, I got to reach out. Um, yeah, and it's it's very interesting kind of in retrospect, looking at how many of those of us who were very integral to that process, how many of those folks are queer, like that Venn diagram is a circle, in, including my the head of the, that former head of the department, like she divorced her abusive husband and married a woman. And my friend Nikki turned what she calls a straight Christian marriage into a lesbian divorce. And so it is funny And I'm, you know, queer and polyamorous. So we all found each other somehow. And yeah, it was a camaraderie in that. Yeah, it's interesting because I have noticed that too, there's a lot of queer survivors who ended up really doing something and speaking up because we wouldn't take it. Yeah, no, I, I think there's something to that. I think when there's such core identity subjugation, happening in, in those kind of environments at so many levels, right? It's a pressure cooker. It eventually will come out. But yeah, no, it is interesting just seeing how many of my old classmates are also queer and polyamorous or or, or part of or members of the LGBTQ. And it's just, it's cool. I enjoy it now. But again, that Venn diagram of both disaffected, vocal, and what I am glad about is I feel like I was on the right side of history there. It was precursor to the Me Too movement. And it was one of the first Me Too mo like movement kind of things before 2014 through 16 really turned up the heat on that. And Boz and his Grace Report really threw things into light. And then later on in 2018 or 19, the Southern Baptist internal reports all finding, no, this is widespread and rampant and across the board, this is happening and this is a problem. Yeah. And it definitely was a key contributor in my mind to the way that definitely played directly into my deconstruction and leaving Christianity. But yeah, like that, that aside, it was, there was a lot of groundswell events that all I think triggered from off of that. So it's, it, I'm glad to, be, to have been a part of it in, in a helpful way and in a way that believed the victim and that helped those who were helpless and battered and, and, and abused and not defending the straight white Christian male patriarchy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Because yeah, they're all about defending that power. And that's why there's such an obsession within those same circles with Trump is that he is the epitome of belligerent, bloativating show of force and show of power. Even when there is no actual competent leadership, when there is no actual skill, when there is no business acumen in real reality, it's all about showing as if you're the big, big, strong guy, as if you've got it all under control and you're this big, powerful vessel of God because you're a man. And it's par for the course that, of course, these same circles, 85 to 95 percent of them take his message hook, line and sinker. Oh, yeah, I know. And it's just... The evangelicals and the fundamentalists have really, I think a lot of us who grew up in these circles, we knew their true colors, but yeah. now oh, yeah. society is seeing that yeah. their true colors now. That's why their churches are shrinking. Yeah, They can't, it's not sustainable growth, especially Gen Z and the younger millennials give zero fucks and they are not going to sit here and put up with the double speak 
and the brown nosing and they, they don't, they just, it's not in their system. It's not in their DNA. Yeah. And I think, yeah, Bob Jones, they're losing control and their enrollment is going farther. Oh, it's plummeting. It's it, plummeting to the point that I'm concerned that I should probably pull my transcript and get it transferred somewhere else just so that my stupid hundred thousand dollar piece of paper is not utterly worthless oh my gosh yes but yeah when you were describing the protest it just i felt the anger in me that y'all are being threatened and people were angry at y'all yeah. for protesting against this horrific crime because it's all about protecting the leadership and if it's again the only way you can maintain power and control is if there is homogeny of message and purpose Right. And so the second you're saying, hey, we need to be holding this leadership accountable. Hey, we need to have third party kind of checks and balances here. This is the same reason why they hate police reform. This is the same reason why socialist policies are all a threat to this, because their power structure is hyper dependent on them being the final authority, them getting to, to control the message and them retaining the money and the power. Yeah, this institution, it's rooted in white supremacy and just 100%. supremacy in general. And I Western know... Western supremacy too, yeah. Yeah, male supremacy, just, yeah. And I think as I've been really digging a lot and learning about fundamentalists and evangelicals' obsession with Trump and why they're clinging to him, because he's their last hope to have their supremacy, Christian supremacy, white supremacy, or whatever supremacy. It is this belief that you're inherently better or your group is better based on some kind yep. of characteristic. And because you're superior, you deserve to dominate everyone else yes, with your system. Exactly. That's my what it is. In, no, and my father-in-law would say, has said those almost verbatim to me. And I outright told him that's not freedom of religion. I disagree with you from a constitutional level. That is not, that's not what the intent, that sounds like a religious test. That sounds like a lack of freedom of religion. That sounds like exactly what the people on the Mayflower were getting away from, away from the Church of England. So what's the difference? And yes, we know that's still referring to the very revisionist version of history, but still even playing to their version of history, it still doesn't add up and it, it's still circular reasoning. And I think that level of circular reasoning and doublespeak is what turned me off to the entire movement, as well as I think by and large, most millennials and Gen Z are just, they're tired of the bullshit. They're tired of the fake. They're tired of the plastic people and the show, right? When, when the rubber meets the road, like these big corporate churches, how much actual charity are they doing? How much actual help are they really doing to their local community? Zilch, nada. And when you try to bring it up, and this is something that blew my mind. When I brought it up and I was like, I was up in New Jersey and I said, hey, Patterson is a really rough area. We should be going in there and helping. And the scoffing I got and the fact that, hey, maybe during pride parades, instead of protesting like Westboro Baptist type people, let's hand out water. And looking back, I'm like, that was, I wasn't an ally. I was one of them. And this is why I was advocating for them. But I didn't know that at the time. That's a much more recent discovery in the last two and a half or so years. But even in the more like liberal progressive presenting churches that had drums and had fog machines and had whatever, they were better marketing with the same nasty innards, right? They were just better at, at showing out to the public and they had better, more talented musicians that could play modern music instead of that boring old hymns. Yeah. And, and really deconstructing that was definitely, there was a lot of other aspects to deconstruction that, you know, were much more defined based off of if, if you ever heard of the Liturgist podcast or Pete Enns, the Bible for Normal People. And some of those resources were really helpful for me to start unraveling a lot of a kind of the spiritual practice that I'd been brainwashed in. And again, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck and fucks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So Again, people shy away from the term cult. If it checks all the boxes, then what? Wh why are we pro having, having problems with the label? Again, these are the groups doing the actions. If they don't like that the, a label is being assigned to them, then maybe they should be a little bit introspective on their actions. And this, it, it, it's also when it comes to that control, like 
there's a lot of it has to do with even the way they do child rearing and child raising. And that was something that we were coming to grips with. And I think the core trigger of, of mine and my spouse's deconstruction was that, was like, wait, if we're treating our kids better than God treats us, there's a problem here. And starting to see that there is no, no hate like Christian love and starting to see that both toward LGBTQ, toward even their own children, where it's like, when you hate, basically hate your child and say, this person's a sinner and not worthy of anything and break their self-esteem and, and like sense of self entirely down, you build these little robots that are so suppressed that have no, no way of relating to the world. And then they get out into the real world environment and haven't ever been given any freedom of decision or thought and suddenly are exposed to all that. And they either double down or they go off the deep or they leave. And we're seeing in droves, I'd say a heavy percentage, probably 60, 70% are leaving. Even when I was well within the church was like, are you building a kingdom here on earth? Or are you trying to build something for later? Because it really looks like building it here. You're setting yourself up here. You're trying to create your heaven here on earth. And it's pretty obvious that Southern comfort, that's what that is. It has nothing to, it's not a pilgrim mindset. And I'm not saying that's a healthy theology either. I don't think it is, but it was interesting that it's like, they talk about, oh, you like all the, you're doing this because you're falling into sin and like the temptation and blah, 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 blah. And it's meanwhile, you're having your fourth cheeseburger. Meanwhile, you have to have your brand new, nice car. Meanwhile, you're in a way oversized house. Meanwhile, you have a washer and dryer that fucking talk to each other. And so it was this, we get to live in opulence because God is blessing us. Instead of, no, we're tilting the system in our favor. And of course, we're in power. And we're going to do everything to make sure it stays that way. And that was very much the messaging. And that was very much the realization I came to, is that if there wasn't bad apples, it's all rotten. Its goals are rotten and harmful to society. And it's part of the reason why I like one of my core sort of axioms and, and goals is very much the destruction of those structures and those institutions. I want to see them crumble in jail. They don't need to hurt any more people. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. This has been <laughs> an amazing conversation. I don't know if there's anything else you want to share or talk about in the next few minutes. There's one other prompt in my brain uh, that we had chatted about before and it is escaping me right now. A lot of this stuff is still very close to home, partially because my spouse is related to a former dean of students who is a published author at that university. And that same person turned over my like private records uh, without my consent to my father-in-law as like, here's the dossier on this guy. And there was also aspects of just, again, me being Calvinist and not having the same end time theology and going to a gray listed church and all of that, that were all, that was my first impression to my future father-in-law to the point that they broke my spouse and I up when we were dating because I wasn't God's will for a while. And there is definitely even there where the, I, I hate the whole blood is thicker than water mindset because as I'm discovering in my queer polyamorous journey, the chosen family is so much better and we shouldn't be holding people accountable for genetic bad luck. If you have toxic family members and hurtful family members, you can cut them out of your life. And that's okay. That's a good boundary. That's a healthy boundary. I'm in no contact with one or two of my siblings because they're racist, homophobic assholes. So why associate? And does it suck? Do I wish that there was connectivity and a better relationship? Sure. But I can only can control what I can control as a person. Not I can't lead that person to a better mindset. And so there is definitely still, you know, that sort of difficulty with both of our families on working through those relationships and still trying to maintain something so that the cousins can play together and so that we can do little mini family reunions. We did do that with my side of the family last year and it was actually better than I thought it would, but like more than 50% of my siblings are still deeply in the cult, right? And then the other percent are uh, queer and live here in North Carolina with me. So it's funny because statistically that's some interesting numbers. I think three or possibly four out of eight being not straight. So some interesting anomalies there. 
Yeah, and it's so fascinating to me how they're like, oh, we we need to shield them from yes all ideas, and it's it still end up being queer. And it's just so funny where then you see and all that these are the same people who are like trying to ban queer books from the library and do all these book burnings and book bannings in Florida and all of that kind of. I want even up here and like over here in North Carolina, we're fighting that here. Oh yeah, Greenville because, is too. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, Ooh. where it's like this idea that, oh, someone will see this queer coded book and it will queerify them and it will suddenly turn them gay or bi or something. And when in reality, my pushback to that is who's pushing a white street codependent marriage culture on everybody with fairy tale stories that we tell to two-year-old girls that this is your purpose in life, that you have to get married and be a mom and have kids and stay at home. Which one is coercion and which one is representation? And at the end of the day, they don't want LGBTQ folks to exist. And that was one of the core realizations I had. All of the counseling that I observed, because I had three different queer roommates on campus and then one of my roommates when I was off, lived off campus, was also gay. I had a lot of exposure to not just the way the university treated folks coming out of the closet, but also the way parents in those circles did. And just the vitriol and the, and the toxicity that it, and, and the hurtful mechanisms and means that were used where they were trying to send them. But what I saw across the board with all of those different queer folks was that they were being told the message of you're useless as you are and you are better off either changing your identity to be in Christ, quote unquote, because it would conflate this idea of sexual identity and gender identity with identity in Christ, which is just a funny mismatch because it's like one is a sexual and physical and like physiological identity and the other one's a spiritual one. So why are you conflating the two? They, the, the choices essentially that they offered these people was either A, you remain celibate and obey God, and, or you're better suiciding yourself. Those are your options. And I find that it's deeply interesting that there's a lot of correlation, I think, to why those suicide rates within the LGBTQ, especially those who are trying to get out of those environments, is so high because that's the options they're being told exist. That's why I, I really try to help support projects like the Trevor Project. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh my gosh. But yeah, it's once you accept their doctrine, it's expected that you throw off any form of individuality and you just become the same as everyone else. You conform, you become the robot. Um, yeah. And that's just, it's horrible. It's horrible. And again, like just the repression, like anything that's you is bad. Think that's you is bad, yeah. and it, that's how they frame it. And you just push that down, and you put on the yeah. beliefs. It's yeah, and it's deeply destructive to your own sense of self and your own self esteem. And yeah, no, lots of years of therapy. But yeah, yeah thank you so much. Yeah, for no, no coming on the show today, and yeah. for people listening, thank you so much for listening to Beyond BJU. Before I end this episode, I wanted to bring awareness to a resource list for LGBTQ plus people specifically in South Carolina. I've been able to thankfully connect with an activist who created this resource list, and the list is called Jacob's Ladder. It is linked in the description, and you can access those resources for LGBTQ plus people. This is a very comprehensive list for South Carolina and the upstate area. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond BJU. My Patreon supporters allow me to do this work, and I am so grateful for them. If you could join my Patreon community, it would be greatly appreciated but if you feel you cannot do that if you could give the podcast a five-star rating on apple podcasts or spotify because this helps other listeners just like you discover the show thank you